This is Indiana Weekend, some of the most interesting people and places from around our region. These are the stories you won't always see on the regular news, voices you won't always hear elsewhere. I'm John Strauss. This is a kind of news magazine show with stories just a bit off the beaten path. Today, a look at Brown County, the way you may not have seen it before. We're in Nashville, where there are all kinds of interesting shops and stores featuring interesting art and crafts work. We wondered where some of the best of that artwork comes from, and we found it right around town in the hills of Brown County. Starting off, you know, I had just the regular, regular things, trying to think of lamps and things people needed and um, functional things, and I probably only had about four designs or five designs spiders, a whole pumpkins, and some things like that. Brown County has a long history as a home for artists even before the days of T.C. Steel more than a century ago. And they're especially busy around Nashville during the holiday season. In the fall, there's the Brown County Studio Tour, a self-guided opportunity to see more than a dozen home studios and more than 20 Brown County artists and craftspeople. They include Brad Cox, who bought some land in the woods on Salt Creek and built his own replica grist mill with a working wheel made from two tons of iron. Inside, his artwork is displayed amid beautiful walnut flooring and cherry ceilings from trees cut on the property. I always came to Brown County when I was a little kid. I mean, many, many times my, my dad or my aunt would bring me to Brown County. And uh, the job that I did was a uh, kind of high intensity job welding on live gas lines and um, you know, kind of really high, which I like that part. I like the higher the better things, but um, you always had people you were responsible for, so you were kind of, you know, at edge. And every time I'd get off this exit here, if you know when you get off of I-65, there's the first hill you see, and it's actually in Bartholomew County, right before Brown County, but every time I would see that hill, um, I'd hit the buttons and I'd let the windows down, I don't care if it's 30 degrees out, and I'd just give a sigh of relief um, and so I didn't think about any of that when I was down here, you know, and it relaxed me a lot. Now his workspace is a converted barn next to the mill. He creates metal art of striking beauty, working with the found objects cast off from industry, from junkyards, anywhere. As I started doing it more, um, it came a little easier to me. Um, different ideas and, you know, I take a lot of repurposed and recycled things. Um, sometimes you have to really look, look at it to see what it is. It's not you know, like a shovel bird or something, you can pick out a piece, really. Sometimes you really have to look at it to see, oh, yeah, you know, the tail of that dragonfly is a, a walnut pick from a nut set. Moving out here wasn't cheap. He gave up good money as a highly skilled welder on pipelines. I had a pretty high-paying job uh, getting ready to make um, a lot more money in the future. And I just, you know, really, you know, gave up that at first for a huge... Uh, you know, I had more time with the kids. I seen them in a day. We could go do things that the kids went with us. You know, all three of my boys, uh, we got three boys, Tyler, Bryce, and Briar, and they all went to the art shows with us. Then there's the simple beauty that's always attracted people to Brown County. There's two places in Indiana that don't look like Indiana. There's, you know, the, the Indiana Dunes up there by the lake up there and in Brown County. Um, the rest is kind of similar, not everywhere, but um, Brown County really has the the feel of a different state and it's so funny people will come down here and now you know first I'll say where are you folks from and they'll say oh we're from you know way up north northern Indiana and I'll say oh where at and they'll say Lafayette you know <laughs> Lafayette's like you know 40 minutes north of Indy uh, they think they're so far south here you know down the road two hours because it looks with the, with the creeks and the ravines and you know the state park if you didn't know it was the home of a welding artist you'd think this was some kind of old mill back in the woods Brad based the idea on a picture that his wife Stephanie liked and built it with a friend. The thing weighs almost 4,000 pounds. We actually built it in three days. It's a 14-foot diameter wheel, and there's 64 individual buckets. I rolled them uh, individually, and we built them out here in a driveway. We made a wooden platform. I had to lift it. with. I had to rent a big crane to come set that. The thing about the wheel, I think, is just to have something that's different and unique, you know, because I always, uh, even when I used to travel, my other job, I like finding a unique restaurant or a unique place, you know, like the Story, uh, Story Inn or, you know, just an old, old-timey looking place. And I wanted to build something like that. He's been welding art full-time for a dozen years. It's hard to say where the ideas come from. I think if you're not so distracted and, and, and you have more time, 
uh, to, to relax a little bit. Your mind has more ideas like that. So one thing may lead to another. Like I, I'll do a certain piece. Uh, I make an alligator that I made for a show in Gainesville, Florida, which was shameless because it was four blocks from the stadium, Gators. But, uh, you know, I had all these little uh, railroad spike heads and, and they laid on my floor for three or four weeks. And so I picked them up and made a sea turtle. I'll show you, I made a sea turtle out of the spike uh, head. So sometimes a part later on can inspire you to make something else. You can't work all the time, and if you're an artist in love with nature, this is a great place to be. It's pretty neat, you know, just to be out somewhere listening to music. Um, you know, the Indiana boys could be playing at the Pine Room, and here you run into these guys. You know, some of these artists at the show, they'll win the best of show out of 300 artists. Um, I mean, that's a hard award to get from all over, people all over the country. And here you're just sitting next to them, hanging out with them, listening to music with some of those artists. Can a location help the creative process? You might think so in Brown County, which even without the colorful leaves is one of Indiana's most beautiful places. There's a long list of artists and artisans who found inspiration here. Michelle Heather Pollock helps organize the Back Roads of Brown County Studio Tour. What is it about this place? Most people will tell you the landscape, of course. It's just beautiful here. It's beautiful year round. People like to come in October because the leaves become spectacular, but I think it's just as beautiful in April when the dogwoods and the red buds are blooming. And then in the winter, when you get, when we do get snow on the trees, um, there's so many places to go out and hike and walk in the state park and Yellowwood Forest and um, people paint outside. And I think that the environment is a big thing, the inspiration, but the other part of it is the community. There's a big arts community here. Um, Nashville is one of five communities in the state that has gotten an arts and cultural district designation and that's largely because of the large number of artists we have and all of the work that we've done together to create galleries and things like the studio tour and it's a very supportive place to live if you're an artist, if you're a working artist. She works in stitched paper and is one of the leaders of the Brown County community of artists. I'm appliquing paper in essence. I'm hand cutting small pieces of paper out of different colors and layering them, them up and sewing through them to make images. And then I'm uh, putting those onto the covers of handbound books that I hand stitch the books together. She's been doing this full time for seven years, though she got started much earlier as a child. Art wasn't her first job, Pollock was a chemical engineer from Purdue who worked in research and development for 3M. But decided that that wasn't my dream job. So I went back to school and got a Master of Fine Arts in Poetry. And the poetry led me to hand bookbinding because I wanted a physical object to hold the poetry that I was writing. So I studied hand bookbinding at the Minnesota Center for Book Arts and then I had one of those light bulb moments when I was sewing a book together. I realized that I was sewing paper essentially and I'd always made collages and I started sewing into my collages and then I started sticking things through the sewing machine that people probably would tell me you shouldn't stick through sewing machines and the next thing you know I've got this medium that I work in. I kind of did it baby steps I guess you'd say because I kept the job for years well, I went back to school one class at a time. And finally, when I got to the point where I was finishing up the poetry degree and I was doing my thesis, you get to a point where you kind of have to jump off the cliff. And so I quit the job and I have a supportive husband who was fine with that. And uh, I jumped off the cliff and started working on, um, on this stuff. Everybody asks me where I learned the book binding because it's a very unusual thing. Not that many people do it. And I did try to teach myself how to do it. That was, that was kind of interesting. I, I thought, well, as an engineer, I can read books about this and I could teach myself how to do this. Now this was pre YouTube. YouTube now you can learn how to do anything on YouTube, but this was pre YouTube. And I tried to read books and teach myself and they were not very good results. So I finally gave in and went to take my first class and that's when every, everything changed. She's among more than 250 artists who make the community their home. 
Some of them do it full time and they do the art fair circuit, um, you know, like, like I do or galleries or combinations of those things. Some of them are much more part time. They still have full time jobs somewhere. And then they're doing this um, in their evenings and weekends. There's a lot of talent here. Everything from painting, which has a long tradition here, goes back to TC Steele. Um, in 1907 when he moved here. A lot of plein air painters, outdoor art contests, those kinds of things. But then we have a lot of fine craft too, a lot of pottery and weaving. And I think what I do falls into fine craft as well with the book binding and knitting and woodworking and metalworking. Brown County isn't the state's only art colony. The Richmond Art Museum is a modern reminder of what's known as the Richmond Group of Painters. Indiana has a rich heritage in art history uh, dating back to the uh, early 19th century and even before that. Uh, there are two major art colonies in our state, uh, Brown County uh, as well as the Richmond Group Art Colony. Uh, Richmond started about 40 years earlier, around 1870, and Brown County began thriving after T.C. Steele moved to Nashville in 1907. Even now, Brown County is recognized nationally as an art center. It is a beautiful scenic area which drew artists to paint, uh, provided the type of scenery uh, that, and the environment that artists wanted to paint. Uh, having someone like T.C. Steele, uh, who was well known to be a mentor, uh, to be someone that they could paint with, was certainly a draw. The Indiana Plein Air Painters Association is one of the largest groups of its kind in the country focusing on outdoor scenes. Indiana is recognized uh, for the quality of work uh, of these artisans and the art that they create. Um, I know there's been uh, state exchanges with other states where Indiana artists have gone out west to, to paint. And so certainly on the national level in terms of plein air painters, uh, they do recognize the significance of not only Indiana's rich heritage, but of what's currently happening today. The Brown County art tradition may be over 100 years old, but interest in Indiana art remains strong. Today we're seeing a revival uh, in the interest in the arts, um, both from the perspective of people who are collecting and wanting to acquire work, as well as people who are producing art. And we have seen both in Brown County, uh, as well as in the Richmond area, um, these areas are thriving again and becoming art centers. Indeed, artists are still moving to Brown County, drawn by the attraction of other creative people, that physical beauty of the place, and more. There's about anything you want. Obviously, I'm really into the arts side of it, uh, but like I said, there's a state park and the state forest, which is just has lots of opportunities if you like to hike or walk. Um, there's biking, there are, there's kayaking on Salt Creek now, there's golf, there's uh, Explore Brown County, which has the, which ironically is owned by one of the artists in the county. Um, it has zip lining and paintball. And so there now is about anything you could want to do in, in a, a beautiful environment. But for many folks, this is country living and that comes with a few challenges. Okay, you want to know what the number one question I get is, how do you drive in and out of here in the winter? That's actually the number one question I get, because we live on a gravel road. And uh, the answer is four-wheel drive. It's a, not a very exciting answer, but we do live here all through the winter, and it does feel like, I mean, you know, you're, I'm two miles from the highway, so you're not exactly, you know, lost, but uh, it does feel like you're in the middle of nowhere when you're here, and I love that. I love living here. Nashville has the feel of an artist's colony. Around every corner, it seems, there's another gallery featuring the work of local folks, not to mention local stores and restaurants of every kind. I love going to Nashville. There's a large number of galleries and places where you can get homemade fudge and ice cream and and now we have a brewery and we have several wineries and there's a lot of uh, really fun unique local things that you can find. She's a mixed media artist still using her MFA in creative writing and the sensibilities of a poet in creating her pieces. I found that moving here my artwork changed. I do more nature than I used to do um, and my writing changed. What's interesting now that I'm doing the studio full-time is most of the writing I do is actually in conjunction with my artwork. 
So I do have artwork pieces that have my text in them, that have my parts of my poems in them, in the pieces. Um, and I find I do that more than I do standalone poetry for publication. So it's a different form of publication. Like there's a piece behind you there that actually has one of my poems stitched right into it. We asked her if she could read the poem. We can wish away the best part of everything if we're not careful. The other side of the story is that wishing itself might be all there is. Meanwhile, stars are born and die, and I'm too busy to notice their glorious demonstrations. In the basement, on clear summer nights, a Ouija board between our bare knees spelled out the names of constellations we had not yet had the patience to learn. Behind every artist is a story of how they got started. Remember those kits you could get to make potholders out of loops of fabric? Chris Gustin enjoyed those as a five-year-old. Now she sells her own, along with a startling array of colorful woven products, including clothes, rugs, and other household items. I am a weaver and fiber artist. I enjoy what I do, and I've surrounded myself with lots of yarn and color and ideas, um, things that just inspire me to create. I experiment with blankets and throws, scarves, shawls, and recycled material for the rugs. She's passionate about recycling, finding raw materials and inspiration almost anywhere. Sock factories create a byproduct that um, they use when they're sewing the sock shut, which they cut off and it becomes waste. Um, normally would go to the landfill. The company that we get it from is very uh, proactive and zero carbon. Um, they really feel like there's things that can be done. When I was trying to find material to weave with that was um, affordable, I went to a Goodwill store where we were living and asked the backroom manager if they had ties that they didn't know what to do with and if I could buy them. And he said, sure, that he would save them for me and to come back in a month. And I went back in a month, or he called. And I went back and he said, I've got 300 for you. And it was 300 pounds or 3,000 neckties. Um, one of the other uh, projects that I started was uh, weaving with plastic bags. And the local waste uh, center, waste collection center, would save colored bags for me and give them to me in these huge uh, bags. and. I learned, I taught myself a way to process them so that they could be made into rugs. Artists like Chris have a mission to keep their craft alive. There's a saying they have, each one, teach one. I'm forever offering to people to come here and learn how to weave. We call it day weaving. Come and weave a rug. It's a non, you know, non, no commitment. You just come and you spend a day and you go home with a rug that you have made. You use the looms that are already set up. It's a way to not really make another weaver, but to increase appreciation of weaving. She has more than 20 looms around her studio for teaching classes. Weaving goes back thousands of years, and machines like this have been used for centuries. You can get the basics in just a few minutes. Not surprisingly, the artists like to teach each other, too. There are artists of all ilk here. They like to learn from each other. The groups that, like the Studio Tour Group and the Art Alliance of Brown County, they do a lot of trade-off um, education-wise. There'll be workshops where an artist will give a talk or give a demonstration so that the other artists can understand without having to, you know, really go into another uh, form of art, but can understand what that particular artist is doing and, and 
where the motivation comes from for that. Nashville, with its dozens of galleries, shops, and stores, features much of this work. It's a tourism destination. People come here not only for the art, but to wander a small, walkable, colorful town. Any town has its characters. Someone popping into this place, the Carmel Corn Cottage, is likely to meet Jim Rispoli, who owned a trucking business in Chicago before he discovered Nashville. This happens sometimes. He came to Nashville, liked it, and decided to move here. Happened to come into Nashville and seeing this is a pretty nice part of the country to live in, close enough to Chicago to visit back and forth. So we opened up the pet store, Jars Pet Palace, we called it. Did that for three years and then found out that once somebody buys a leash, it don't wear out. <laughs> so this shop came up for sale and I bought the shop. Now it had two types of popcorns when I came into here, caramel and cheese and I've got about 18 to 20 things in here now. So it's really became successful. We are very busy in our season. This is in our season, but we do a lot of internet work now because this is what I've done. Got out of trucking completely and got into the retail end of it, you know, and it's a lot more enjoyable, like talking to people, you know, and in here you see a lot of people, you know, and that's what I enjoy. And I got some good people working for me. I had five people in here this year. I just keep one throughout the winter. We stay open all winter long. We've heard stories like this before, people falling for Nashville just when they're at that stage of life when they're ready to downsize. I like living out here, a small town. You know, I live a mile out of town now. Got a little bitty house, had big homes in Illinois. And uh, I got a small house in here with an acre of land and like it out here, uh, you know. Uh, just a fun place to live. Lots of people, you know, and not in the winter though. Much of the Brown County artwork comes to places like Spears Gallery in the middle of Nashville. Jan Spears runs the gallery, which even on a weekday seems busy with a steady stream of customers. It's a lot of fun. A lot of local artist representation in here, so honestly I'm never quite sure exactly what is going to be in here. We have mm, about 20 different artists working here and at least probably 90% of the work is all made locally uh, by Brown County Hands. It's a family business. Her husband Larry creates this remarkable pottery. Photography and other artwork are contributed by their sons. Many of their friends create art too. There's definitely a community of artists here and they work well together, uh, resourcing different materials, sharing different methods um, and putting on different shows, you know, collectively. So yeah, so it's, it's a nice community to, to, to fit into. They feel at home in Brown County, which takes pride in its artistic heritage. I think it's a combination of things, but I think it's definitely um, a welcoming community and historically was an arts community. So it's very welcoming to artists um, and supportive. So I think that's, that's a really big part of it. And just the natural beauty is very inspiring. She's very familiar with the people we met on the Brown County Artist Tour. Michelle Pollock is represented here with her um, handmade greeting cards. She does these beautiful cards that are all hand-stitched, uh, wonderful designs. And quite frankly, many of those that leave our shop are going to be framed in someone's home. Typically, they prefer to do that instead of use them for greeting cards because they're so lovely. So we have Michelle's work, we also have Brad Cox, a Brown County artist, and he is a metalsmith that has an awful lot of fun doing what he does. And he makes some real one-of-a-kind, unique pieces uh, with, and does a lot of welding. And has a unique place in Brown County as well with a mill. Um, additionally, Chris Gustin's work is here. She's a weaver um, in the southern part of the county, out in our neck of the woods where our studio is. She's been out there for, oh gosh, probably 16, 17 years, I think. And she does some really nice work. It's not surprising that the variety of work here brings Brown County some international attention, especially since Bloomington is so close. Probably within the last month, the gentleman that I remember from the farthest away was from Zimbabwe that came to Nashville. Um, had friends, I believe, in Bloomington 
and he was visiting, but anyway, took a few uh, smaller pieces back to Zimbabwe with him. So he was just, uh, the language was a little bit of a barrier, but he was enchanted with the area and certainly with the handmade work. She has some simple advice for first time visitors. You just should get lost. Get lost in town and you'll find some wonderful treasures hidden all over this little town. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun place, eclectic and fun. Eclectic is a pretty good way to put it. Along with all the other shops and galleries, the artists themselves have a store, a co-op where you can find strictly local work. There's a variety here that's actually about more than just the art, more even than the incredibly popular Brown County State Park just outside Nashville, more than a few restaurants for the gastronomically curious, the husband daycare for spouses who need something to do besides shopping. In the end, Brown County and Nashville may be as much ideas as places. People come here to shop, sightsee, create, and most of all, maybe to just get away from the usual places where the rest of us live, the places that aren't at all Brown County. That's our show for today. Thanks for being part of it with us. Hope you'll join us next time as we find more stories off the beaten path from across the state on Indiana Weekend.